Recording in progress. Okay. We are, this will be midterm week. If, uh, if we were giving exams, uh, this would be the first, well, I don't know. I mean, usually I, I used to give four exams, so this would be the second exam, but this would be your midterm exam. Uh, we are about a, a day ahead in the syllabus. I'm going to still talk about chemical reactions today, which is what we're scheduled to talk about. But my book, uh, the book that I'm using, does not cover redox reactions in this chapter, which I think is a mistake. So we're going to do redox reactions today. And if we have time, maybe we'll talk about ionic reactions. Um, redox reactions is scheduled to be a topic a couple of weeks from now, uh, which means that as we cover it, we're going to be ahead. Uh, once we hit redox reactions in the chapter where the book covers it, my book covers it, uh, it will be like a refresher. It'll be, you know, um, it'll sound familiar because we've already covered it. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do balancing redox reactions or not. Uh, balancing redox reactions are actually a lot of fun. There's a certain set of rules if you follow them. Um, you can you can balance some very complicated redox reactions that you could not. Well, I won't say you could not. It'd be very difficult to balance by hand. Um. Because we are ahead in the syllabus, that means those special topics days are still uh, on the list. So start thinking about topics. If you could pick a lecture on chem in chemistry on anything you would like to hear about, let me know. Um, I have one person attending live. Uh, my last video had four views. I know that I was one of them. I'm guessing that Kim here was the other was another one, which means we still have a couple of mystery viewers out there. Um, so if you know Kim uh, or if you want, just leave a comment on one of the videos and say, hey, I, I, I'd like to talk about sex. Whatever, we can talk about sex and chemistry. Anything you want. We're still, I think, um, the last chapter that we're going to cover here is actually nuclear chemistry. Mm, pardon my voice, puberty, you know. Um, so certainly that would segue nice into how to make your very own, own homemade atomic bomb, which would be very cool. Um, I talked about how to make an atomic bomb and I, you know, on exams every once in a while, I would like to give kind of give me questions for my students. Why is it no longer active? Because my thing is asleep. That's why. And I gave this silly little lecture how to make an atomic bomb. Okay, let me get the sharing because it's not sharing at the moment. We do this and it should share like that. And so on an exam, I put a little uh, discussion question or, you know, uh, and I'd say, how do you make an atomic bomb? And the student drew a diagram of an atomic bomb. And this was her idea of how to make an atomic bomb. And she labeled it. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her a point for making me chuckle. <laughs> okay. But that's a topic for another day, if we decide to do that.
But let's talk about redox reactions today. This is an addition to. So you have your four basic reaction types. You have your single addition. Uh, I'm sorry, you have your combination, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement. Uh, this is in addition to. So you might have a double replacement with a that is a redox reaction or an addition that is a redox reaction. Um, redox is short for oxidation reduction. Oxidation reduction. And we call it redox because ox red doesn't quite sound correct. So redox is actually technically it stands for reduction oxidation reactions, but you know, oxidation reduction reactions. Oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions are reactions where you have physical transfer of electrons. We've talked about this before where an ion uh, an ionic compound is caused by the physical transfer of electrons. An electron physically is transferred from one element to another, creating an ionic compound. Sodium, now here's something, here's the first lesson in redox reactions. Every element has a charge or an oxidation number. Uh, we say oxidation number because in NaCl, the net charge is actually zero. So you might hear me talk about the oxidation number. You can kind of think of the oxidation number as charge. It's not quite charge, but eh, we can think of it as charge. Anytime you have anything in its elemental state, okay, its elemental state, the charge is zero. The oxidation number of anything in its elemental state is a charge of zero. Now we know that in sodium chloride, because sodium is an element one, I'm sorry, family one element. It's a uh, an alkali metal. In the compound, it always has a charge of plus one. Now keep in mind that to gain a plus one charge, sodium has to lose one electron. Now we have two, we have two sodiums here, so we will actually end up losing two electrons total. But each sodium will lose one electron as it goes from a zero oxidation state to a plus one oxidation state. Losing an electron may sound a little odd because when we say that it is um gaining a positive charge, it does that by losing an electron, which sounds counterintuitive. But keep in mind that, I'm gonna move this a little bit. Keep in mind that the charge of electrons is negative one. So to gain a positive charge, it is losing that negatively charged electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, is gaining an electron because it's going from zero to minus one. But 
Oops. Chlorine is a halogen, which means that in compounds, it will have a negative one charge. It's a halogen. Group seven to prefer. Halogen. Now, of course, total, we have two chlorines. So again, we are gaining two electrons because there are two chlorines, which raises a very, very, very important point. Electrons cannot come from nowhere. They cannot go to nowhere. Every time. Every time you gain or lose an electron, that has to come from or go to somewhere else. You cannot. The world is electrically neutral. Wow, am I struggling today? I apologize for that. The world is not electrically neutral. Those electrons must come from somewhere. They must go somewhere. And you'll probably hear me repeat this several times throughout the remainder of the course. Every time you have an oxidation, you must have a reduction. All right? Oxidations cannot occur without a corresponding reduction. Similarly, you cannot have a reduction. I must lift my middle finger there because that's what I was using. That would be bad, okay? You cannot have a reduction without an oxidation. Every time you have one, you have to have the other. That's life. That's just, that's the way God decided it has to be, and we are going to do what God says. We have some terminology here. It's going to sound a little bit weird. Losing an electron is called oxidation. We say that sodium is oxidized because it loses an electron. That means that as you gain an electron, it is a reduction. Again, a little counterintuitive. You're losing an electron. No, you're gaining an electron, but it's a reduction. When you gain an electron, that's called reduction. So oxidation is the process of losing an electron. It is oxidized if it loses an electron. It is reduced if it gains an electron. The process is reduction, gaining an electron. This sounds counterintuitive. But if you look at a number line, remember these from math? Because electrons are negatively charged, by gaining an electron, chlorine is moving in the negative direction. The charge or the oxidation number of the chlorine is being reduced. It is becoming more negative. That's why it's called a reduction because the charge is, is the oxidation number is actually being reduced. Now for me to memorize this, I just remember it as the opposite of what I wanted to be. Gaining an electron, the opposite of what I would want that to be, that would be reduction. Couple of other terms here. If something is reduced, that means that something else must be oxidized. So anything that undergoes reduction is called an oxida oxidizing agent.
If it is reduced, it is an oxidizing agent. It is being reduced because it is causing something else to be oxidized. That means that if something is oxidized, it is sometimes called a reducing agent. A reducing agent. Some very important terminology here. Um, a lot of important concepts, important concepts. Gaining electrons, reduction, losing electrons, oxidation. This is what redox reactions are. The earliest redox reactions are based on burning. Uh, when you burn something. It is a redox reaction. Every time you have a reduction, you have an oxidation and vice versa. Yes, I'm repeating it a lot because I think it's that important. Important. Any questions about what we have done so far? No. So you can see here, we have more than two reactants and we have a single product. Do you recall the name of the reaction when you have a single product, but more than one reactant? It's called and two things coming together. What kind of a reaction is that? It's an addition reaction. So you'll notice that this is an example of an addition reaction, but it's also a redox reaction because oxidation numbers are changing. So how do you know if a reaction is redox or not. I'm a little under the weather today. I had something really stupid for supper last night. I made sausage gravy and I love sausage gravy. I will eat it with a spoon. And usually I'll split it up into two different meals. And I ate the whole thing yesterday, which means that yesterday I ate a pound of sausage, a quart of milk, a stick of butter, I'm kind of fighting an upset stomach today. Now, this is kind of a dumb thing to do. Do not do this. But one of the things that I will do is sometimes take baking soda. I really don't like antacids. That chalky taste just kind of drives me nuts. Um, so sometimes I'll just take a little bit of baking soda, dissolve it in water, and drink it. It's a very effective antacid. I tell you not to do it because unlike antacid pills, the amount that I take is not measured. And it is possible to have too much of it, which could put you in a medical condition called alkalosis, which means your body becomes, becomes too alkaline, too basic. But um, this is usually what I do. I take baking soda, which is formula is sodium bicarbonate. It's 
sodium bicarbonate, HCO3 with a negative one charge is, um, by, is bicarbonate, HCO3 with a negative one charge. That is the bicarbonate ion. You might look a little familiar. CO3 with a negative two charge is carbonate. Another name for this might be sodium hydrogen carbonate, which would be just as valid of a name. Uh, but I told you we didn't do all of the names. So um, just in case you want to know it, if you've ever been curious as to what a bicarbonate is, it is a polyatomic ion. There's a formula HCO3. So it's just like carbonate with an extra hydrogen with a negative one charge. It reacts with stomach acid or hydrochloric acid. To form sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, which is why you belch, and water. So it neutralizes, it takes away that HCl. Is this a balanced equation? Well, let me see here. You have one sodium on the reactant side and one sodium on the product side. We have, ooh, this is not balanced. We have one hydrogen on the reactant side and two on the product side. So we need a two in front of this. But if we need a two in front of this, sodium is no longer balanced. So we're gonna need a two here. Oh, I am wrong. I am wrong. I am wrong. I am wrong. Well, you have to be so careful when balancing reactions. I forgot something here. We don't have one hydrogen on the reactant side because we have another hydrogen here. So we have one sodium and one sodium. We have one plus one or two hydrogens on the reactant side, and we have two hydrogens on the product side. We have one carbon on the reactant side, one carbon on the product side, three oxygens on the reactant side. We have two plus one or three oxygens on the product side, one, one chlorine and one chlorine. Yes, this is a balanced equation, but, is this a redox reaction or not? The only way you can tell if this is a well, no, there's a trick. I'm going to tell you the trick here in a minute. But the way that you can tell if a reaction is redox or not is by determining the oxidation number of every element in the compound, in, in, in the reaction, every element on both sides. If you find the oxidation number changes for even a single element, it's a redox reaction. Um, but you don't know just by inspection. Well, I mean, actually, I'm going to show you a trick. Sometimes you can't, but usually you can't tell just by inspection. So... Let's figure this out. Sodium is a group one element in, an, in its elemental state. In any element in its elemental state has an oxidation number one. But alkali metals, I'm sorry, I have it. <laughs> That's wrong. Let's do it again. Any element in its elemental state has an oxidation number of zero. But if it's in a compound, sodium or family one always has an oxidation number of anybody? One. Plus one. So when sodium bicarbonate, sodium is plus one. And sodium chloride, it is plus one. It does not change. Hydrogen is also group one. So its charge is typically... Yes, plus one. 
Carbon, we don't know. Oxygen is a uh, calcogen. Its charge is always what? Yes, minus two. Now notice here, hydrogen is all plus one. We have two hydrogens. That gives us a net of plus two. Oxygen, there's only one of them, gives us a net of minus two. Remember, every compound will have a total charge of zero, unless it's an ion. Ions, of course, are different. So here, here the total charge is minus one. But keep in mind, that if it's not written as an ion, the total charge must add up to zero, or the oxidation number will be zero. Uh, chlorine is a halogen. It is always minus one. It does not change. The only thing we don't know is carbon. So the oxidation number of carbon, we're going to call X. We have two high oxygens, each with an oxidation number of minus two. That must add up to zero. That means X minus four equals zero. So the oxidation number of carbon is yes, plus four. What about here? We have one sodium with a charge of plus one. We have one hydrogen with a charge of plus one. We have one carbon with an oxidation number of X. We do not know. And we have three oxygens with the charge of minus two, and that must add up to zero. So we have one plus one plus X minus six equals zero, or X minus four equals zero. X, the oxidation number of carbon here is plus four. So the oxidation number of carbon does not change. No element in this reaction changes oxidation numbers. That means that this is not a redox reaction. I'm going to give you a hint here. If you find only one element that changes oxidation numbers, you have made a mistake. You cannot have a reduction without an oxidation. You cannot have an oxidation without a reduction. So if you find even one element, if you find only one element that changes oxidation numbers, something is wrong. All right? Something is wrong. If the question, if you're doing homework sets, and the question is, find the redox reactions, if you're confident you're doing correctly, as soon as you find the first one that changes oxidation numbers, you're done. That's a redox reaction. You know something else in there has to. Would you like to see another example, maybe one that is a redox reaction? Yes.
friend of mine makes bath bombs. I had this really odd thought. If I made bath bombs, I would make a bath bomb that smells like bathtub fart. And the funny thing is, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but if you pass gas while taking a bath, it just smells so much worse than if it's just in the air. I don't know why. I've never understood that. But if I made bath bombs, I would make a bath bomb that smells like bathtub fart. And I wouldn't sell it. I would hide it among the other products so people would randomly get a bath bomb it just smells like fart. A lot of people assume that farts are caused, the smell of farts are caused by methane. They are not. Um, it's actually caused by hydrogen sulfide, uh, which smells like rotten eggs. But a lot of people assume it's methane that smells so bad, and methane is highly flammable. Now, if you burn anything organic, you will always get carbon dioxide and water. The product of burning organic material is always carbon dioxide and water. There are sometimes, well, I'm sorry, there's always carbon monoxide given off as well as a side reaction. It does not always burn completely, which means if you have gas in your house, if you have a gas oven and stove, if you have a gas water heater, if you have a gas furnace, if you have an attached garage, get a carbon monoxide detector, which I, in fact, get a few of them. Uh, because carbon monoxide is colorless and odorless. And you will not know that you are suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning until you start getting the symptoms, which includes headaches, drowsiness, and death. Once you're dead, there's very little we can do for you. So get carbon monoxide detectors. Get them today. Get them. Get them. Uh, get a lot of. So the first thing we need to do is balance. Because anytime you have a chemical reaction, you balance it. That's just the rule. Now I am not going to balance the oxygen yet. Usually, notice we have nothing here in its elemental state, so there's nothing that we are going to save for the last thing. But I am going to save oxygen as the last thing I balance, and here's why. Oh, it is an element. I'm sorry, it's in its elemental state here on the reactant side. But oxygen is also present in not one but two products. So if oxygen was off balance, which one do I balance? The carbon dioxide or the water? I don't know. Since I don't know, I'm going to leave that and let it self-balance. I'm going to balance everything else. So we have one carbon on the reactant side, one on the product side. That looks okay. Four hydrogens on the reactant side, but only two hydrogens on the product side. So we need to put a two here. That does not affect the carbon. We still have one carbon, one carbon. Now we have four hydrogens, four hydrogens. Now we have two oxygens. It's the last element, so we have to balance it. Two oxygens here. Two plus two times one gives us two. We have a total of four oxygens on this side. So we put a four here. It is a, a uh, balanced reaction now. The question is, Is it a redox reaction? By even without going any further, I can tell you that it is a redox reaction. Would you like to know how? Here's the trick. In any reaction where you have something in its starting or ending, actually, if you have anything in its elemental state, 
either as a reactant or a product. The product, it is a redox reaction. If the question is simply, is this a redox reaction? Yes, it is. Done. It has oxygen in its elemental state, it's redox. Why? Because in its elemental state, the oxidation number is always zero. In a compound, it is never zero. So it has to change oxidation numbers. Oxygen. Calcogen. We actually did this above. What's the charge of oxygen when it's in a compound? It's always, always, always minus two. That means that oxygen is gaining electrons. If it's gaining electrons, what's it doing? Is it being oxidized or is it, is be, is it being reduced? If it is, sorry? It's gaining? Gaining electrons, it is being reduced. Uh, reduction, it's reduced. And if it's being reduced, what kind of an agent is it? It just seems so backwards. <laughs> it does, doesn't. It just takes practice. It just takes practice. It's an oxidizing agent. But if something is being reduced, something else has to be oxidized. What's being oxidized? Let's see if we can't figure that out. Well, hydrogen in a compound is always plus one. Carbon, we don't know. In methane, Carbon takes on an oxidation number of minus four. Carbon dioxide the oxidation number is plus four. Oxidation number in carbon dioxide is plus four. Therefore, as it goes from minus four to plus four, it is actually losing. Let's do this slanted. How many electrons total is it losing? Eight electrons. Is losing eight electrons as it goes from minus four to plus four. It has to lose four electrons to get up to an oxidation number of zero. It's going to lose four more electrons by to get to the oxidation number of plus four. Total of eight electrons. It is losing electrons. It is being oxidized, which makes it the reducing agent. Notice you're going to lose as many electrons as you gain. We're actually, <clears throat> we're actually, we actually have four oxygen, I'm sorry, eight oxygens total here. Is that right? Oh, I did that wrong. This is not balanced. This is not balanced. We have two oxygens here. We have two times one gives us two oxygens here. We have four 
oxygens total, with the stoichiometric coefficient, this is eight oxygens. I put the wrong number down there. See, even I make mistakes. We only have two oxygens here. So we have four oxygens total in our reaction. Each one of them is gaining two electrons. Four times two means that we are gaining eight electrons total. So the exact same number of electrons that are being lost are being picked up. This is a redox reaction. <clears throat> what is being reduced is oxygen. What is being oxidized is carbon. Carbon is the reducing agent. Oxygen is the oxidizing agent. Let's take a five minute break. I will meet you back here at 1045, please. And welcome back. Okay, we did a couple of examples of redox reactions. Um, we could do some more redox reactions and really you know, beat this dead horse into the ground. Um, let's do something a little different. Something else that I don't believe is covered in this chapter, in my book anyway, but something that, that I kind of want to talk about. I wasn't sure if I would have time. Usually I would not because redox reactions, the next topic would be balancing redox reactions. Now I love balancing redox reactions. It's just a fun thing to do. Now there's a series of rules. It is quite complicated actually. Well, I mean, it's when you're first learning it, it seems complicated, but it's also beyond the scope of this course. So let's talk about something else. But I would like to talk about is something else that is not covered in this in this chapter. It has some more terminology. Come on, there we go. Um, but the concepts are kind of important. So let's start with an example, shall we? Let's take sodium hydroxide. An aluminum nitrate. Both in solution, colorless clear solutions. And what you will get in the end are three sodium nitrates. And then aluminum hydroxide. It's a very fine white precipitate. Uh, when you form a solid out of liquids, uh, that solid is called a precipitate. Usually precipitates are called such because they kind of fall out of solution and get solid on the bottom of the beaker or the reaction flask. Aluminium hydroxide, on the other hand, is very fine. Um, it tends to remain suspended in solution, which means that you end up with a milky white kind of a solution. Um, kind of the consistency of phlegm. We've talked about ionic compounds before undergoing dissociation. Now, this is your traditional chemical reaction. This is how you traditionally would write your chemical reaction. But ionic compounds are called electrolytes, which means they have one third fewer calories than regular electros. Some of beer commercial, just like regular electrodes, but one third fewer calories. Now, an electrolyte, as you recall, dissociates in water into ions. 
Ionic compounds are held together by electrostatic charges. So when they are in water, they will dissociate. So you have your cations and your anions. Um, it's the cations and anions in water that will conduct electricity, which is where the term electrolyte comes from. Water does not conduct electricity if it's pure enough. You can never get it pure enough. But if it's pure enough, it does not conduct electricity. And one of the ways to test the purity of water is to test its ability to conduct electricity. The better the insulator the water is, the more pure it is. Um, Ionic compounds dry do not conduct electricity, but you put ionic compounds in water and they dissociate into their respective ions. So sodium hydroxide here doesn't float around as sodium hydroxide in the water. It dissociates. So you have sodium And you have hydroxides. Now keep in mind that this stoichiometric coefficient three applies to everything in that ionic compound. So it applies to the sodium, it also applies to the hydroxide. Now when they dissociate, polyatomic ions remain polyatomic ions. So the hydroxide goes off as its own, but it does not further dissociate into oxygen and hydrogen. It remains hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide will dissociate into sodium and hydroxide. Similarly, aluminum nitrate. Here's the hint, the big hint, by the way, aqueous. If it's aqueous, it dissociates. So aluminum hydroxide dissociates into aluminum, which as you recall is a plus three charge. This three outside the parentheses only applies to the nitrate. So we only have one aluminum, but three nitrates. And nitrates are always cheaper than day rates. So before the reaction, you have sodiums floating around, you have hydroxides floating around, you have aluminiums floating around, and nitrates floating around. On the product side, sodium nitrate, notice, is an aqueous solution. It dissolves. If it dissolves, and it's a, well, if it's an ionic compound that dissolves, it dissociates. So on the product side, we also have sodium ions and nitrates. And notice this three applies to both the sodium and the nitrate. But, and this is a big, hairy but, notice that aluminum hydroxide is a solid. The aluminum hydroxide does not dissolve. If it does not dissolve, it does not dissociate. If it does not dissolve, it does not dissociate. Okay, you with me so far? Does that make sense? Okay, this is called the total, like totally dude, Ionic equation. The total ionic equation. Mm -hmm. 
This just shows everything in its dissociated state. Okay, but I want you to notice something here. Here we have sodium ions in the reactant side and sodium ions in the product side. Now the hydroxides are in the ionic form on the reactant side, but not on the product side. So the sodium ions do not change. They're exactly the same, but the hydroxide does. Starts off as a polyatomic ion in the reactant side is part of a compound in the product side. We would call sodium a spectator ion. Because it does not change in the reaction. It's just sitting around watching Sitting around watching the action, not actually participating. If it derives from a potato, we would call it a spectator tot. It's like a joke. It's just smaller. Is sodium the only spectator ion in the equation? What do you think? Is aluminum a spectator ion? Or does it change in the reaction? The aluminum is an ion in the reactant side, but it's part of a product in the product side. It's part of a compound. So the aluminum is not a spectator ion. What about nitrate? Is nitrate a spectator ion? Yes. We have nine. You are absolutely correct. We have uh, uh, nitrate as uh, aqueous uh, ions in, in the reactant side and the same in the product side. They do not change. So our nitrates are similarly spectator ions. If they are spectator ions, we need to write them in the reaction. I'll give you a hint. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. They're not doing anything. They're sitting there watching. So what difference does it make? So we can take the spectator ions out and simply write this. This is the meat and potatoes of this reaction. This is what's actually happening. This is the important part of the reaction. We call this the net ionic equation. It's the important part. It's the uh, meat and potatoes. Notice a couple of things. Because we do not write down the spectator ions, does not mean they are not present. We sometimes call them counter ions. So they're spectator ions or counter ions. The role of the counter ions is to make up the charge difference. 
Before I mix these, I'm gonna have a container of sodium nitrate and have a container of aluminum hydroxide. I'm sorry, aluminum nitrate. Sodium hydroxide and aluminum nitrate. That's the two beakers we have. The sodium is still there. It has to be because we cannot have a charged beaker of, uh, of, of hydroxide ions. Oh, God, I'm having so much trouble with this. We cannot have that imbalance. That hydroxide has to have something there to counter, counterbalance the charge. Happens to be sodium. So even though the sodium does not participate in the reaction, it's still present. On the other hand, we have aluminum and nitrate. The nitrate does not participate in the reaction, but it's present because it's counterbalancing the charge of the aluminum. So they're present. They just don't participate in the reaction that we want. The other thing to note is that because they do not participate in the reaction, they don't have to be that specific ion. If I go into my stock room and I'm looking for a hydroxide to run this reaction, my first thought would probably be sodium hydroxide. Ah, crap, look, I'm out of sodium hydroxide today. Now what? Well, the sodium is just a spectator ion. So I can choose anything that dissolves in water that's a hydroxide. So yes, I'm out of sodium hydroxide today, but look, here's potassium hydroxide. Because the sodium does not really participate in the reaction, potassium hydroxide is just as valid. Potassium hydroxide will, in fact, do the trick. Am I brave enough to try that? No, that would be too complex. That would be too complex. I'm not going to do that. Sometimes now, the other implication is that sometimes in reactions, you will see ions like this. You will see ions in a reaction. If you see ions in a reaction, that means that there are counter ions in that solution as well. So even though we're not writing sodium or potassium or whatever hydroxide I happen to have, just because I'm not writing it, those are still there. There have to be counter ions because I'm writing this as an, as an ionic species. Similarly, with my aluminum as an ionic species, there has to be a counter ion of some kind there. Might be nitrate, might be sulfate, uh, might be chloride. I don't know. But there will be counter ions present. So anytime you happen to see something in its ionic form, just know that there's more to the eye than what you're picturing. These are two pretty heavy topics redox reactions and net ionic reactions. Um, we got through them in pretty quick order. I'm kind of surprised, honestly. So I am about to jump into chapter six, which is states of matter, which we kind of talked about once before, and I'm basically going to do a review. But before I do, are there any questions about chapter five as I fight my migraine? Any questions about redox reactions, 
traditional total and net ionic equations, spectator ions, reaction types, balancing chemical reactions, stoichiometry. Would you like to see another stoichiometry example? Uh, this was all in chapter five. Wow. Anything, uh, any questions you have about any of that stuff? No. <clears throat> all right. It is October. Being October, it is Halloween season. Instead of of, I'm going to write O. Oh, straits O oh matter. The Legend of the Jack-O-Lantern, by the way. I'm going to take a little aside here since we're so far ahead of the syllabus. Jack was an evil man, sinful man. He gambled, he drank, he fornicated outside of marriage. He was doomed to hell. Um, but one day he happened upon the devil as he slept in the tree. So Jack carved a cross at the base of the tree and the devil could not cross the cross, could not descend the tree. So when he woke up, he was trapped. And he asked Jack to let him go and Jack made a barter with the devil. And Jack's bargain was, I will remove the cross if you promise me that you will not admit me to hell. And the devil said, sure, deal. So when Jack died, he was sure he was going to heaven. But the problem is he was not a righteous man, so he could not get into heaven. So he went to hell, and the devil, being spiteful, reminded him of his bargain and the only thing apparently worse than hell is not being admitted to either heaven or hell so the devil sent him back to roam the earth as a doomed soul but just to be nasty just as a reminder he gave jack a carved pumpkin and he put within the carved pumpkin a glowing ember from from the pits of hell to light his way. Hence the jack-o'-lantern. That's the candle in the pumpkin that we do on Halloween. So states o matter. We have three main states o matter. And we talked about them before. I don't know if you remember this or not. They have solid. We have liquid, and we have gas. Unless you're Rick Jagger, in which case it's a gas, gas, gas. There are more states of matter. The glassy state, for example, um, is considered its own separate state of matter. And it is actually quite complex. Glass is far more complex than you might think. Liquids are col um, not colorless. They are not, some, some are colorless, but they're not all colorless. Liquids are clear. They're always clear. There's no pattern. They're randomly distributed molecules. Um, So let's get back to that in a moment. We can talk about that. So solid, liquid, gas, unless you make Jagger, in which case it's the gas, gas, gas. It's like a joke, it's just smaller. Solids, as you recall, have fixed shape. We talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. And fixed volume. This chair that I'm sitting in is a solid. It is useful as a solid because every time I come in this room, I know it will be in the shape of a chair. And because it's fixed volume, 
It's not going to be bigger than it was yesterday. It's not going to be smaller. It's going to be the exact same size every time. Liquids have variable shape. But fixed volume. The Diet Coke in this bottle, I have drunk this much of it, which means if this much liquid remains, that volume is not going to change until I take some out and drink some more. So the volume is fixed. I can't sit here and wait for it to refill itself. But I can turn the bottle upside down, and now it has a different shape. Now it's coming to a point in the end before it was flat. Here it's flat with weird little divots here for the bottle. It assumes the shape of the container, but the volume is fixed. In the gas, we have variable shape. Wow. and variable volume. Gases will expand to fill the, the volume of the container. Um, so if you have a plunger, you press it down, and you let it expand, you can vary the volume of the gas, and the gas will assume the shape of the plunger, the shape of the piston. Variable shape and variable volume. Solids, I'm sorry, glasses, you melt uh, silicon dioxide down, sand, into a liquid. Um, so in your solid, you have a regular repeating pattern, <clears throat> repeating pattern, <clears throat> compounds, It's a regular repeating pattern. The molecules are stuck in location. <clears throat> when I taught chemistry in a lecture hall, I would have typically 100-ish students in a lecture hall. And I would use that as an example because where the students were sitting was akin to a solid. Um, they had vibrational motion. The kids were not, you know, they would fidget, you know, they would shift in their chairs and, and sometimes we'd be a little more on this side and sometimes we'd be up taking notes and sometimes, sometimes they'd be leaning back thinking, what the hell are you talking about? So they could move around in their chair, but there was not a lot of translational motion. There was just vibrational motion around fixed points around their chair. That's a solid. We have vibrational motion around a fixed point, but the molecules are not really moving. No, I do put that. So this would be a solid. Now, what would happen? Eventually, the class would end. And when the class ends, students would begin moving around the room. 
Eventually, they're going to leave the room. But before they actually get out of the room, they're just moving around the room. They're collecting their books, their things, they're getting out, they're walking to the aisles. They are free to move about the room. So now you have freedom of motion and random distribution of these particles. So you've lost that beautiful little fixed pattern. So you have your freedom of motion, which gives you a randomness. But in a fixed volume, this is a liquid. OK, they're still inside the lecture hall. They're still in that room but they're no longer at their seats. Now they're out and roaming around the room. Eventually, they're gonna get out of the room into campus. They'll have complete freedom of motion. They are free to go anywhere on campus or off campus. I don't know where they're going. This is not a quass. This is a gas. Unless you're Mick Jagger. It's like a joke. It's just smaller. So in a gas, particles are free to move anywhere they want. There's absolutely no pattern whatsoever. On a molecular level, this is the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas, gas, gas. Okay? Okay. To describe states of matter, eh, you know what? I don't think we have enough time to go into that. We'll start that next time. But... Here's how you make a glass and why it's such an unusual state of matter. By the way, plasma is another state of matter. Plasma is created when you uh, have a temperature so high that molecules and atoms themselves begin to fall apart. A glass, a plasma, if you look at a flame, a flame is a plasma. It's basically gaseous free radicals. They're just falling apart. They're too hot to even remain molecules. That's a state of matter. Uh, not to be confused with plasma. I don't know if you can still see it. Uh, I had to have a blood draw not too long ago and they did a terrible job. I had this huge bruise here um, for a couple of days. Um, that plasma is a little different. Plasma in medicine refers to the fluid in which red and white blood cells flow. Um, that's the plasma. Uh, you have your plasma, your platelets, and your white blood cells, are the three components of blood. Um, anyway, so here's what happens with the glass. You take a solid, which you cannot see through. You can't see through sand. Take silicon dioxide or quartz, if you will, and you melt it down so it becomes a liquid. As a liquid, it becomes clear because liquids are clear. You know what? The more I say this, that's not quite true. There are liquids that are not clear. Anyway, you melt it down into a clear liquid. Now, the quartz wants to be in an ordered crystalline pattern. All right? That's what it wants to do. But it, you undergo what's called quenching which means you take that liquid silica and you cool it down rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that the molecules do not have time to rearrange themselves into their original desired crystalline shape. The viscosity 
That is to say, viscosity is defined as resistance to flow. So honey has a very high viscosity. Water has a much lower viscosity. So the viscosity of that liquid increases as you drop the temperature until it is moving so slowly that for all intents and practices, it's not moving at all. So now you have a solid where the molecules are arranged randomly as if they are a liquid, but they don't have time to recrystallize, which is also why older glasses sometimes are more brittle and easier to break because on a molecular level, those molecules are rearranging themselves into crystals, forming little micro crystals that you cannot see, but in the end is making the, the glass structurally less stable. So it's a very interesting state of matter. It has the structure of liquid, but it's not free to flow, which makes it a solid. It's its, its own state. Next time, we're going to talk about what it takes to define states of matter. And we're going to start talking about some laws. Uh, so chapter six on Thursday. Thank you so much for attending before we break any questions. Oh, thank you. All right. You all have a great day now.